Hello and welcome to IV Fluids, Which One is Which? My name is David Woodruff. I am the editor of Critical Care Nursing Made Incredibly Easy. I hope to make this incredibly easy for you too. Let's talk a little bit about IV fluids and how we classify them based upon osmolality. First of all, we have our hypotonic fluids, and then we have isotonic fluids and hypertonic fluids. We'll get into that in just a moment as to what the difference is between those fluids. But we classify the hypotonic fluids as being D5W and 0.45 saline, in other words, uh, half normal saline. Our isotonic fluids being normal saline, or 0.9%, and lactated ringers. Our hypertonic fluids include our 3% saline and some combinations of our lactated ringers or saline along with D5. So when we talk about this whole idea of osmolality, what we're talking about is the movement of fluid between two different spaces. So if this bar in the middle that we're seeing here, if that is a membrane of some sort, so maybe the uh, uh, blood vessel wall, or maybe it's a cell uh, around a cell membrane or something like that, but it's some place that is keeping things contained. It's a, maybe it's a tissue. And on one side of that tissue, we have so many sodiums. And obviously, on the left side, we have more sodiums than we do on the right side. Because of that, what's going to happen is fluid is going to move from where there is less of a concentration to where there is more of a concentration. Another way to think about this is that fluid is going to move to the side that is dehydrated. So because there's more sodium on the left, that means there's less water, and we need to dilute that sodium, so water is going to move from the right side to the left side to dilute that sodium. So if this is the tissue and the bloodstream, and then we have our little membrane there in between, what we're going to see is that movement of fluid, or that movement of water uh, from the blood and then into the tissues. So because there's fewer solids on this side over here with the blood, that means water is going to move then to the side where the solids are. Again, going back to this idea of osmolality, so we have our normal value there of osmolality, which is 290 to 330. Now, depending upon your lab, some labs, maybe 290 to 300 or 295 to 305, whatever the case may be. So check your lab is for what your normal value is. That varies a little bit because of the me mechanisms that they use in our labs. Uh, we'll have different numbers. But if we're working with this number of 290 to 330, then our hypotonic fluid would be that that is less than 290. Our isotonic fluid would be those fluids that run in that area of 290 to 330, which includes normal saline lactated ringers. And then above 330 would be our hypertonic fluids, which is D10 or D5.5, D5LR, or 3% saline. Solutions that contain dextrose are a little bit different in that once that fluid is administered to the patient, the dextrose becomes metabolized. So the liver is going to metabolize that dextrose, it's going to take it out, it's going to use it, it's going to put it into storage, but it's no longer part of the equation. So then we're left with whatever is left. So when we take a look at hypotonic fluids and we talk about D5W, D5W is actually isotonic or maybe close to being hypertonic. But once we give that to the patient, then the dextrose is metabolized and what we're, we're left with is just simply water. And water is hypotonic in comparison with blood. So the big three that we normally use is normal saline lactated ringers and D5W. So let's talk a little bit about those. Normal saline is great for be expanding our volume when our hematocrit is adequate or stable. So if the patient's H&H &H is stable, uh, certainly we wouldn't want to expand the circulating volume if the patient's hematocrit was very low. Uh, that would hemodilute the patient even more and make it even harder to get oxygen to the tissues. So it's used for volume replacement and shock and DKA. In DKA, we have severe dehydration and in other dehydration states. Also used in hyponatremia and hypercalcemia 
to be able to dilute that calcium or to give some sodium in the case of hyponatremia. So it helps to replace the sodium. It doesn't replace a lot of sodium. That's why we have 3% saline uh, in cases where we really need to move that sodium up considerably. But if we're giving normal saline over a long period of time, we will tend to see a resolution of our sodium in those patients who have hyponatremia. Use caution in heart failure, though, because normal saline can lead to edema formation. Lactated ringers is isotonic. Lactated ringers is also used for volume replacement, again, when a hematocrit is stable, used for shock, for blood loss, dehydration, for burns. Basically, lactated ringers is normal saline, but it also includes potassium, calcium, and lactate. So use caution in using lactated ringers in our patients with renal failure because of that potassium. Use caution in liver disease when using lactated ringers because of that lactate. D5W is initially isotonic, but physiologically it'll be hypotonic. Again, that's because the dextrose is metabolized, just leaving the water. So it'll be used in cases where we have hypernatremia and we need to try and dilute that sodium down a little bit. Uh, rehydration, in some cases of rehydration, or calorie replacement. Now keep in mind, though, it's not enough calories really to maintain nutrition, but it does help. It gives a couple hundred calories a day when you're giving D5W. Use with caution in renal disease and heart failure. We can end up with volume overload, and in diabetes, it can lead to hyperglycemia. So what about colloids? We haven't mentioned those in this equation here. Those include things like albumin and starch. There's less hemodilution that occurs with colloids. There's more fluid that remains in the vascular space. More expensive, though, and we have better outcomes in sepsis and ARDS. Or blood. Blood stays in the vasculature, provides oxygen-carrying capacity, stable. When blood is warmed, six units. If we are giving that much blood to a patient, we may need to include fresh frozen plasma, cryo, or platelet transfusions because we're not only losing blood in those cases where we have to give a lot of blood, we're also losing our clotting factors. What about blood substitutes? So there's a number of blood substitutes that are being researched. The hemoglobin-based type, little oxygen carriers, perfluorocarbons. Uh, they don't require cross-matching because it's not really you know, a living thing in the body, and it's, it's not a red blood cell. They can be stored for up to a year, so they're very stable, but there's no evidence that they improve mortality, and they're very expensive. So the, the ones that are shown here in the diagram, it shows the red blood cells, how big it is, and then the hemoglobin-based oxygen carriers, and also the perfluorocarbons. Since they're smaller, they can get into those small, teeny little blood vessels that are kind of clamped down, et cetera, the ones that the red blood cells can't get to. They may be able to get to areas where we have occlusion, for example, in patients who have myocardial infarction. But we don't know enough about them to be able to use them really intelligently. And again, there's no evidence that they improve mortality. Well, thank you for joining me for IV fluids. Which one is which? I hope this helps to clarify for you when you're going to use certain IV fluids and what they contain and how they're going to help your patient. Thanks again for joining me. My name is David Woodruff. Until next time, bye now.